Welcome to Radio Free South Africa. This is your host, Karen Smith. Please be aware that this media is only possible with the help of your donation to help keep us on air. So please go to our store and indulge in some goodies or make the best donation you can in order for us to keep bringing you truth and news that the mainstream will not. Our guest today is Ken Giverden, well known from his blog, The Daily Ken. Ken is a staunch supporter of the South African cause, blogs about it almost daily to help us to spread the truth about the Rainbow Nation, and I'm honored to call him my friend. We decided that it was time for our listeners to hear the South African story from an American perspective, and Ken is uniquely qualified to talk about this. Hello and welcome, Ken. Uh, good afternoon. How you doing? I'm good today, thank you. And you? As far as I know, I'm doing well. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm <laughs> glad to... Because you, you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, exactly, Ken. It could change in one second. Ken, I'd, I'd like you to just start out by telling our listeners a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in the South African cause. Well, to begin telling a little bit about myself, I'm 62 years old, and man, that's hard to believe I'm actually, uh, I've actually made it past 60, I guess I should be delighted. But uh, I don't feel that old, but every time I look into a mirror, there I am, it's kind of hard to deny reality, so you have to accept it as it is. But uh, my passion at the moment is just simply uh, publishing the truth, undaunted by intimidation by the political left on my website. And we've been very fortunate in that we've had uh, millions of people come visit our website. I think the count is now around 8 or 10 million people have stopped by. Typically, we'll have maybe 10,000 a day, so we're not we're not huge, but it's uh, there's a sizable audience. You can imagine, uh, by analogy, if every day you had an opportunity to speak to a crowd of 10,000 people, well, effectively, that's what we're doing with our website. Wow, congratulations, Ken. That is a fantastically big number. Yeah, I would rather be a hundred thousand or a million a day. And some sites, you know, have that traffic. I think Grudge uh, has several million people come by his place, uh, his site every day, but uh, that's exceptional. So we're grateful for what we do have, but it's uh, it's uh, it's a thrill to be able to have a medium at your fingertips, literally, because of the keyboard, Karen. Where you can uh, tell the truth. So, so that's a little bit about me. I live in Indiana. I've got a family. They're grown. Hard to believe that, but uh, you know, I've got grandkids, couple grand dogs, and uh, that's about me personally. But uh, my passion for South Africa is part of a larger global perspective that we see what is happening to Western culture is it's being destroyed, and I think it's being destroyed intentionally. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, Ken. There's no, there is no question about that. Uh, you know, it's happening so fast worldwide, but it did start in South Africa. I think that South Africa was the blueprint to see if it would work and if they could do it under the radar, and they've managed that. And so now it's spreading all over the world, but at a much faster rate than it happened in South Africa. You know, the power of the media is a primary contributing factor to uh, what they have been able to accomplish, or I should say unaccomplish, uh, in in South Africa and around the world. Because the media is just simply a, a very powerful medium in that it gets inside our heads and it convinces us. I don't know what it is about the, um, about the human brain, because I'm not obviously a trained neurologist, I'm not a psychologist, but I do know this. But the human mind has difficulty separating reality from fantasy. And we, when we watch images and we hear words, say, on television or in the cinema, or even reading them and creating those images in our mind by reading uh, novels, our mind has a very difficult time separating fiction from reality. And... Uh, you know, psychologists understand that. And so by using Freudian psychology, and particularly with television, they're able to get inside our heads and form our opinions. And we don't even know it. We think we're being entertained. But I think they... that's what happened with South Africa, because I can remember back in the 1990s when the road was going on about apartheid. And I couldn't help but to think back then, what the, what is what is going on in South Africa. Isn't this kind of obvious? But to a lot of people, no, it wasn't. It was a matter of uh, social 
social justice because that's what has been pounded into their head. And of course, in reality, there was social injustice. I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, one of the idioms that Karl Marx pounded into the heads of his followers is that you accuse others of what you are doing. So if what you are doing is, uh, as opposed to true social justice, you accuse the opponents of doing that. And you say what you are doing is social justice. Well, we can see what has happened in South Africa in hindsight. Not to mention what we can see happening right this very moment. That the real social injustice is not what happened to the uh, to the black majority, but what is happening to the white minority. The uh, you know the simple fact of the farm murders being uh, committed in South Africa almost it seems like every week there's a new story going out. Uh, coming through the media, which we never received in the mainstream Marxist media, but you can find it if you look for it. And some of those we publish on our website, and I know you published them on uh, your page on uh, Facebook. But how do we ignore those things? Well, the media doesn't bring them to our attention. The national media doesn't bring them to our attention, so out of sight, out of mind. But if those types of uh, criminal activities, those types of murders, were reversed, where white people were killing black people in record numbers, uh, we would never hear the end of it. It would be ongoing over and over and over and over again until we were just totally outraged. But that's not what's happening. So effectively, we have been and we are being lied to. And it's, it's really troublesome to see uh, to see that happening. So somebody has to speak up. Somebody has to tell a story, and not just in South Africa, but around the world. And that is why the mainstream Marxist media hates us. Now, I don't know if you caught this, Karen, in the news this week, but the uh, Attorney General of the United States, Loretta Lynch, was speaking to a group of Muslims, which, in my opinion, Islam is the world's largest, deadliest, um, bloodiest, and oldest hate group in existence uh, since 9-11. Uh, there have been over 27,000, uh, over 27,300 terrorist attacks committed by Muslims. And you compare that, for example, to the number of terrorist attacks committed by, say, the Ku Klux Klan, which is zero. Why is it that the media will not characterize Islam as a terror group? Well, we consider it a hate group. But... The liberals don't want to do that. So anyhow, Loretta Lynch was speaking to an assembly of Muslims this week, and she made a very profound statement. She said that any speech that predicates violence against Muslims will be prosecuted. Now, of course, she uh, she prefaced what she said by noting that uh, we are a country that believes in free speech. But no, no sooner that she said that, but she said, in effect, here's an, exa- here's an exception to free speech. If you say anything and that predicates violence, you will be prosecuted. But only against Islam, not, not, not against us, because there is so much out there against white Christian conservative people. But that's fine. That's allowed. Yeah, that that is permitted, and uh, uh, she obviously will not say that. But the point of all that is we are facing perilous times because the conversation that we're having this very moment, if the federal government determines that what we're saying predicated violence, then we can be prosecuted. You know, if somebody listening to this radio broadcast so in that case, we go out and shoot somebody and say, well, why did you do that? And his response would be, well, because I listened to Karen Smith and, and Ken on the radio, and they, uh, whatever they said prompted me to kill somebody or shoot at somebody, then we can be prosecuted. In other words, hate speech is very relative uh, to their interpretation. It can be just about anything. And so that's one of the problems we're facing. When we start, uh, and I know this is a real problem in Europe, if you, if you tell the truth at all about uh, the Islamic insurgency there, you can be prosecuted. In fact, uh, Marine Le Pen, uh, a noted politician who may very well be the next president of France, 
was being prosecuted because of something she said, uh, which is which is very accurate about Islam, got her in trouble, and that's coming to the United States, and we're going to have real problems, even talking about South Africa. So the point of all that is this: in the future, you know, this is the harbinger that we've got to be careful, got to be uh, watchful of. In the future, we're going to be placed in a position where we can't say anything we want to say. We can't tell the truth. Well, but Kane, the truth will not get out. You, you, you started by saying, aren't we fortunate to be in a position where all we need is a keyboard and we can get the truth out? Now, that is working against us right now because the powers that be have realized that their lies are exposed soon after they, they tell the lie. So now... They have to shut us down. And this is what they're doing to do that. Now, if they shut the the un, unmainstream media, the alternative media down, we're done for because the truth will never get out there. Well, that gives us a little window of time, but I don't know how long it's going to last. And maybe we will uh, persevere and maybe we will overcome. And I hope that we do. Well, we can't sit back and do nothing because we may lose in the end because if we quit, who else is going to do it? Well, exactly. Exactly, Ken. And that that is the whole point of people like yourself and, and a handful, a handful of other people who dedicate their time and energy. You're 62, so am I. You've got grandkids, so am I. We we should be spending our golden years having fun with our grandkids. And yet, look what we're doing instead. Because somebody has to do it. And it seems to be us. And if we don't do it, who will? Well, I've just had a comment here. The same people that pushed free speech in the 60s when they wanted to rele release a torrent of filth in our country are now pushing hate speech laws. And it's the same thing. The free speech was to release the, the gays, the transgenders, and all of these things. And now hate speech is doing exactly the same thing. It's promoting uh, same-sex same marriage and... and uh, Oh, well, you understand that it's it's not a choice. You're born that way. Well, it's ridiculous. And the country's going to fall apart under political correctness. The predatory left has always been very liberal with their interpretations of uh, terminology. They will say one thing and mean another. Uh, I recall back in high school, the, um, the um, thing that, the far left was advocating back then, as you noted, was uh, free speech. And the reason is they didn't feel like they had an adequate voice, but that was an intimidation to get us to be quiet. If we say something, it's hate speech. If they say it, it's free speech. And so to shut us up, they need to, uh, they need to intimidate us. I don't know if you, there was a movie that was out, I don't know, maybe a year or two ago. I saw it on a DVD. It was called Home. It was an animation about space aliens that uh, invade the uh, invade the Earth, the planet Earth. Basically, it was just a, a multicultural propaganda film. But uh, one of the villains in the movie was uh, this little guy who held a scepter that was called his Shusher, and uh, he represented, from a Marxist perspective, you know, us. We're the ones who are trying to shut up everybody else. But anytime somebody would say something that he didn't like. He'd smack him on the head with his scepter and uh, his shusher, and he would shut him up. Well, that's a good analogy of what the predatory left is doing with us now. Every time we say anything, they shush us by calling us racist or xenophobes or Islamophobes. And the thing that's frustrating, Karen, is it's actually working, and it has worked very effectively. You know, it's amazing how many people are so intimidated. I'm talking about people that we would consider conservatives, so a lot of white conservatives. They're terrified of telling the truth because if they do, somebody will call them a racist. I, uh, a few months ago, I had a conversation with a friend at a restaurant. We were sitting at a Dairy Queen having a, a, just talking about politics because that is our passion. You know, we talk as if we could solve the world's problems sitting there uh, eating ice cream. <laughs> yep. Uh, well, while we were talking, you know, I was talking about 
racial things, and uh, the tone got very hot because it's something, well, you don't want anyone hearing us say this. Some of the things I mentioned was, you know, the first, uh, the first legal slaveholder in American history was Anthony Johnson. He was an African. He was a black guy. How many people know that? Well, nobody. Because they don't want to, Ken. They don't what? want to know it. They don't want to take note of facts because it doesn't fit the narrative. It doesn't fit the cultural Marxist narrative. So it's just deleted as if it never happened. But we were talking about these things, and I asked him, how many people know that there were literally thousands of free black people during uh, the antebellum South era, the slavery era, who themselves owned a slave labor? Nobody knows that, because, like you say, it doesn't fit the narrative. The narrative is that uh, during the slave era, uh, all white people owned slaves, and the slaves picked cotton 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 365 days a year in the hot sun, yep. which of course is just nonsense. But the point of all that is this, while we were having that conversation, uh, I found my friend was talking in very much tone. It's almost like you know, this was forbidden topic, something you can't talk about in public uh, and probably not even in private. Why is it that we're so intimidated that we can't tell the truth? I mean, it's, it's just a matter of fact. And another point, uh, a data point is the fact 52.2% of all homicides in America are committed by blacks. Nearly all but black males ages 18 to 49 who comprise about 4% of the population. So about half of all violent crime in the United States is committed by about 4% of the population. Why can't we say that? It's a government statistic. Why should we have to ignore that? Well, like you say, it doesn't fit the uh, Marxist narrative. But the point of all that is we're intimidated. We've been bullied to silence because if we tell the truth, they will immediately call us racist. We will be stigmatized. We will be ostracized. We will be stereotyped as a goofy Ku Klux Klaners. And so everyone is afraid to tell the truth. And we're more comfortable going along with the flow and the warm and fluffy, fuzzy feeling of uh, multiculturalism. And by the way, I don't have a problem with non-white people. Uh, for that matter, multiculturalism, when you get together with people who aren't white, what's wrong with that? Well, nothing. What is wrong is when cultural Marxism, which leads to economic Marxism, uses that as a leverage to destroy Western culture. And then it becomes a very wrong thing a very evil thing, and we're allowing that to happen. But the point of all that is we're being intimidated. We're being silenced. Uh, the predatory left will not let us speak as soon as we speak up. They immediately call us racist. They immediately play the uh, Islamophobe card or the xenophobe card, or they will, they will use these names. Never logic. They never contend with us on a rational basis. It's always either sarcasm or name-calling. And we backed and on. We, we let them get away with it. We That's backed what? on because we are so scared of being called a racist. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, Ken, but in the in the connotations of that word, I'm not a racist. But I, on the other hand, I am proudly racist because I'm proud of being white. I'm proud of the achievements of my race. I am proud of what we have developed, created, made this world into. So, and why am I not allowed to be proud of that? Well, if you stop and, and stop and think about it, stop and consider it. I say this all the time. I've, I've mentioned this on my website probably dozens of times. If a listener is right this very moment, will look around their, excuse me, their immediate environment, and, it's, you know, what do you see? You see electric lights, uh, you see a keyboard, you see a table, uh, I see uh, fabrics, you know, I'm just talking about my environment here, I see uh, a composite material, like plastic, so forth, I see a uh, headphone, telephone, look out the window, I see an automobile, all those things were invented by white people, virtually all of them. Why is it wrong to acknowledge that? You know, if you if you say those things, they will use another uh, use another pejorative. They'll say, "Well, you're a white supremacist because you're telling the truth." Well, in some ways, uh, different people groups are superior to others. Why can't we acknowledge that? We know it's just a matter of fact that East Asian uh, 
East Asians have, in an aggregate, a higher IQ than white people. That is why in the United States, the average East Asian household has a higher income than the average white household because they're smarter. I mean, the average is not, uh, it's not exceptionally higher, but it is higher. Mm -hmm. And it's reflected in uh, their income. Well, why can't we acknowledge that? Why can't we say a white guy invented uh, the electric light bulb? Why can't we say a white guy invented the automobile? Why can't we say a white guy uh, discovered how to uh, how to um, harness atomic energy? Why why can't we say those things? I mean, it was white people who went to the moon. Uh, there were some black people involved in that, not very many, and uh, we should give credit where credit is due. But why can't we say those things without being called a racist or a white supremacist? Because. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, it just doesn't fit the narrative. And the narrative is this. The, Mar the cultural Marxist narrative is this. The white people are the bourgeois oppressors, and non-white people are the oppressed proletariat. It's classic Marxism. And, you know, Karen, they say that, that talking about the predatory left, they say that they are anti-racist. And again, uh, Karl Marx said, accuse the others of mm. what you were doing. The fact of the matter is, they are the racist because they want to destroy all these innovations that enhance the lives of all people, you know, white or otherwise. They want to take those things away from all people. When, when the innovation of Western culture is gone, uh, who's going to provide medical care for Africans? You know, the Ebola virus, it was Western technology that saved countless millions of lives because our technology was taken to Africa and eradicated, effectively eradicated the Ebola virus. It was Western technology that uh, has provided not a cure for diabetes, but an, amil an ability to control diabetes which is prevalent among the black population, along with uh, hypertension or high blood pressure, which is prevalent in black populations. And so all these benefits, um, life enhancements that Western technology has afforded to people, to use the Marxist term, people of color, came from white people. They want to take that away. Now, to me, that is racism, because they are the ones who are hurting people of color. Now, having said that, let me say this. You know, the, the predatory left says they are anti-racist, but they are the ones who divide us between white people and people of color. Now, no sooner than they say that, that they will turn right around and say that race is a social construct. Well, you can't have it both ways. But they do. They, at one moment, they'll say it's a, it's a social construct, that there's two of us. It's uh, Then they will say there's two groups, there's white people and people of color. And the white people are the oppressors, where the uh, bourgeois and people of color are the proletariat, they're the oppressed. And so they try to play both sides of the card at the same time. But here's the thing, Karen, they won't shut up about it. If you were to go to a liberal website right this very moment, MSNBC, uh, Huffington Post, any of those websites, I can almost guarantee you that you're going to find some article about racism. They talk about race constantly. The reason I say all that is to say this. I believe that the predatory left comprise real racism. They're the ones who are hurting what they term people of color. It's not us. You know, we are the ones who provided the innovation to eradicate who knows how many diseases for example, we often hear that uh, when Europeans came to America, we brought with us uh, certain diseases and we infected the, uh, the aboriginals who lived here. But what they never talk about is that Western innovation provided the, um, the cure for that. The cure for those diseases. And we saved the lives of countless thousands, if not millions, of Native Americans, of Indians. By the way, I live in Indiana, so I can say Indian. Uh, you know, I grew up in Indianapolis, so I can say Indian. Uh, they say we're supposed to say Native American, but if we did that, we'd have to change the name of our state because we live in Indiana. We'd have to call it Native American. <laughs> <laughs> Indianapolis, Indiana.
championship. There's actually a, a <laughs> minor league uh, ball team by that name. But, you know, the, the smallpox virus is a good example. There is a, uh, there is a prevailing story that the predatory left likes to reverse over and over again. That About the blankets. But they say that there was a man who intentionally infected blankets with a smallpox uh. virus and gave those to Indians. Now, that story may be true. I don't know. But even if it is true, they still ignore the fact that Western innovation, white people, invented the antidote to the smallpox virus and effectively wiped, well, literally wiped it off the face of the earth. Well, absolutely, Ken. And the, the point that you have made many times is if they get rid of the whites, then all of those dreaded diseases, including the plague, will be back. And there will be nobody to sort it out because the other races are not busy finding cures, creating things. They're still not doing that. So if we disappear, I, I, I don't know if you've seen the Mad Max movies or that, but that, that's kind of how I imagine the Earth to be if the whites disappear from it because they, things will just fall apart as they have in South Africa. Everything will collapse given time and there will be nothing left. Well, I've got to confess that I have not seen the Mad Max movies, but I've heard about them. Is that the series of movies that starred Bill Gibson? Yes, it is. It is. I read somewhere, this has nothing to do with anything we're talking about, uh -huh. but I read somewhere that the Mel Gibson was paid 400 some dollars for his first appearance in those movies. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. But that, that, that is quite possible. Ken, it's quite possible because they were kind of B-grade movies when they first came out, the first one, but it got a cult following a bit because people could relate to the end of the world being like that and people turning into kind of feral animals who fought each other over scraps of food and bits of petrol and 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 that although the movies are not fantastically well made, I I I kind of relate the end of the world or the end, the disappearance of whites to that because that is more or less what has happened in Africa. The colonialists have been thrown out and the country has become unproductive, desert-like terrain, and now they're fleeing to white countries again after throwing all the whites out. Yeah, you know, Mel Gibson, we're a little bit off topic here, but he made a movie a few years ago called, I think it was 2006. It was called, but I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right, Apocalypto. Yep. I don't know if you saw that or not. N no, but I've heard of it. The, the essence uh, of the movie, uh, and I thought it was uh, very well done. I thought it was a little gory, but it was very well done. The essence of the movie was he presented life in America before Western intervention. And it was extremely violent, but it was dead on accurate. And the very closing scene of the movie is the uh, the, the hero who was the, uh, you know, the guy who was, uh, they were trying to kill, but he got away with his life and saved his family, the Indian. <laughs> the very closing scene of the movie, he looks over the horizon and he sees a uh, ship sailing in from Europe, something he's never seen before. And the message I think that Mel Gibson was making, and I think he was dead on accurate if this is what he was doing, is he was making the point that this horrific violence that existed in the Americas before the arrival of Europeans was abruptly stopped. Maybe not abruptly, but within a matter of uh, generations it was stopped. Yes. And you have to consider, Karen, that for millennia, for thousands of years, uh, there was intertribal warfare that went on in the Americas. It was a very bloody time. And we're talking about an era that spanned of thousands and thousands of years. Well, Westerners moved in and stopped all that. You know, I don't think there's been a bloody uprising of intertribal warfare in well over 100 years. We take credit for that. We have saved the lives of millions of Americans because we brought, we brought peace to them. Now, when was the last time a Native American, an Indian, ever walked up to a white person and said, I just want to thank you for stopping, uh, you know, these thousands of years of violence. 
them because we were killing each other. They say that the early settlers who came to the United States uh, before it was the United States, as they would travel into the, uh, as they would travel westward, westward into what we would call the wilderness, if they would encounter Indian tribes, they said there was something that they noticed existed in virtually every village. And that is, they were greeted with uh, uh, what, what are they, the, the scalps of their, en of their mm -hmm. enemies. Mm -hmm. And that's the life they lived. It was terribly violent. And we put an end to all that. And we hear about, you know, the uh, so-called Trail of Tears where the Indians were <laughs> were forced to march westward. What they don't tell you, they tell us, is that there's still a lot of Indians living east of the Mississippi. So they weren't all forced to go out there. And what's more, a lot of those who participated in the Trail of Tears actually traveled on boats. They don't tell us that. They don't tell us that when the Indians went westward, they were accompanied by medical professionals. They tell us that there was uh, there were people who died along the Trail of Tears. They don't tell us those same people would have died had there not been a so-called Trail of Tears. And so history is, is very skewed. But the point of all that goes back to what we're talking about initially, is that we have effectively, I hate to use the term brainwash because it sounds so trivia, trivial rather. But it is. It is but it is brainwashed. Conditioning no, of some Ken. sort. We conditioned, Ken. Our minds are conditioned, yeah. Absolutely. Because, you know, I was watching... Well, I've noticed recently, and I, uh, it really scares me, how Hollywood... And uh, I'm sorry, we we seem to have gone on to the, the movie scene, but they have a huge amount and a huge amount of blame to bear for what happens. Because every single movie you watch today, whether it is a kiddies movie or an adult movie, it doesn't make any difference. Somehow, there's black and white sex, there's, there's uh, lesbianism, there's gays. In every single movie, they are conditioning us to accept us as the norm. Well, that is precisely what they're doing, is they're creating a new normal. Yes. And we're accepting it. But it's not yes. normal, Ken. I know I'm old-fashioned, and I know that, that I'm probably a little bit, uh, there's an Afrikaans word for it, which is for crump, which means, um, uh, gee, I don't even know how to, to uh, translate that. Um, but Yes, I probably am those things because I am old fashioned and I, I live within certain boundaries and I believe in right and wrong. But uh, I cannot accept these things as normal because they are not. It, it is not normal to have same sex marriages because they cannot have kids. So here we go again with the, the white race is already diminishing because whites have got enough brains to see that if you're not flourishing financially, you shouldn't have a lot of kids because you can't support them properly. So already we are reducing our numbers and now we're being brainwashed, conditioned to reduce them even more by not breeding at all. Um, you know, when you say that, what comes to mind is what I call the pseudo-feminist movement or the yes. neo-feminist movement. Yes. They uh, they like to attack white males as the ultimate evil. But if you listen to these people speak, speaking of the uh, pseudo-feminist, they not only attack, attack white males, but they also attack what they call the 1950s housewife. Yep. Was the ultimate form of evil. Uh, the, the progressive insurance uh, commercials that has flowed, you know who she is. So they actually made a black and white commercial in which uh, she was ridiculing the 1950s housewife. And I'm thinking to myself, how anti-woman can they be? Mm. How misogynist can they be? And they're attacked. Because it was the 1950s housewife, it was also the 1940s housewife, the 1930s housewife. Yes. You go back for thousands of years, and those yes. were the women who were the underpinning of cultural of Western society, and they're demonizing them. To me, that is anti-woman. That's uh, that's an real anti-feminism. So once again, Marx said, "Accuse others of what you were doing, and what they are doing is they're being anti-woman." And while we're on that topic, I'm, and we're just—I guess we're kind of uh, meandering 
here with what we're talking about. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm thinking back to Loretta Lynch speaking to this group of Muslims. What group on earth is more anti-woman than Islam? I can't think of any. No. There she is, encouraging them, uh, saying she's going to defend them with the power of the federal government. If anybody says anything against them, uh, you know, it, it's it's very frustrating. You know, keep in mind that in the United States, thanks to Western culture, there's not been any major military battle fought on U.S. soil, speaking of, you know, the contingent United States, 48 states, Alaska, Hawaii, since the end of the Civil War. We have been living in peace. Now, there is in Georgia uh, a monument on private yes. property, you've heard of this, called the uh, Georgia Guidestones. Yes. And on those stones, literally etched in stone, are the objectives of the predatory left of cultural Marxism. And among those objectives is to maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance, according to the etching, in perpetual balance with nature. So what these people want to do, and they put it in stone, mm -hmm. you know, talk about put it in writing, they etched it in stone. They want to decrease the world population to uh, 500 billion or less. Well, there's right now 8 billion people. Well, there's a lot of people going to have to die. Yep. Well, who's standing in the way of it? Well, white innovation is standing in the way of it. Did you know this, Karen, that in the year 2014, for the first time, very first time in human history, fewer than 10% of the world's population lived in abject poverty. Now, what the liberals told us a, a generation ago was that as the population uh, exploded or as it increased, that would lead to poverty, it would lead to famine, it would lead to uh, economic crisis. Yes. But the exact opposite happened. And the reason is, I believe, the more people there are, the more intelligent people there are. And the more intelligent people there are, if you take that innovation and you couple it with free markets, what happens is life enhancements are bound to occur. And we can see those all around us. But that defies and defiles what Marxism believes. They don't want us to be productive. They don't want us to live enhanced lives. So they want us to be equal. They don't care about life quality. They care about life equality. That is their sense of morality. And of course, they always exclude themselves from that. You know, like the, uh, there's only one fat man in North Korea. <laughs> you know, he's the exception. Everyone else has to live yes. in equal poverty. Yes. And that's the way Marxists think. But kill off effectively seven and a half billion humans. And they can't do it because white innovation is blocking the way. We, we keep, you know, we keep, uh, you know, we're feeding more people than have ever been fed before. Uh, those who study agriculture have a measurement whereby they they assess how many calories are burned when you are raising calories, when you are uh, engaged in ag agriculture, when you're raising food. And so there's a ratio of calories burned by calories consumed. And we find as Western technology has advanced, it takes fewer and fewer calories to raise food than it did in the past. And today it takes almost no calories at all to raise a lot of food. And so, you know, I'm sitting here uh, looking at myself, and quite frankly, I can lose 50 pounds. And we're seeing that all over the world, and the reason is because of white technology, white innovation. Yeah, that we sit on our backsides all day behind our PCs because we don't have to get up and go outside. Yep. I've kind of made it a habit of um, two or three times a week going out to a state park and just walking for, for um, up to three hours. And I'm still, still, you know, overweight. But if you consider our ancestors 100 years ago, there just weren't a whole lot of overweight people. 
Absolutely so, not. But they uh, worked from yeah. dusk to dawn. They had very, uh, their lives were regulated by nature, by, by, by the seasons, by the sunrise and the sunset, and they worked damned hard to survive. We yep. don't have to. We don't have to. But what we are seeing now is what I think is a, uh, a horrific lack of sense of uh, gratitude. You know, there is a, a movement on college campuses right now where uh, black students in particular are protesting racism that doesn't even exist. Yes, yes. And I call it the crybaby movement. And I'm wondering, do these uh, do these college kids have no sense of gratitude at all? Are they really so brainwashed or blinded that they can't see that everything in their possession is the outcome of uh, white innovation? And can't they say thank you for inventing the cell phone? Can't they can't they say thank you for electric lights? They like to create these uh, what they call safe places. Yes. I've heard that. They're going to uh, a college, uh, um, uh, what would you call it, a big room, a gathering place, and they, they say only people of color can be in here and all white people have to leave <clears throat> because we're going to be safe from uh, white racism. You well, know, we can't get away from white people because everything in that room was invented by white people. Exactly, exactly. And Ken, my, my favorite story of the week was those people at a college who need trauma counseling because they saw a Confederate flag on a laptop. Oh, and, and a whole class needed trauma counseling for that. How uh, the mind boggles, that's all I can say. <laughs> Well, it's obviously staged, it's obviously faked, but, uh, you know, these kids, I think some of them are really convinced that they're being oppressed by the presence of the uh, Confederate flag. Uh, a lot of them have to know better than that. But that is a problem. They're, you know, they are, they are creating racism where none exists. They talk about uh, microaggressions. They talk about white privilege. Where do they come up with these things? Well, they have to come up with them because racism, quite frankly, is not there. And so they have to create this, this fake boogeyman that uh, they're constantly chasing. doesn't even exist. They talk about uh, transgenerational trauma caused by slavery. You know, because my great, 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 great grandpa was uh, a slave, I am uh, facing trauma. Of course, it never occurred to them that the slave owner may have been black. They yes. don't know that because it's not been taught to them. But it's just bogus. I call it uh, astroturf racism. It really doesn't uh, really doesn't exist. They have to make it up because racism just doesn't exist. If there is any racism, it's anti-white racism, and we see that all the time. Um, if you go to my website, I did something this week just uh, just for the fun of it. I did research on all the black affinity groups I could find. There's an association of black lawyers. Yes. There's an association of black police officers. There's a group of black uh, historians. There's a group of black teachers. And I found about 120 of them that had uh, reference to race in the name of the organization. And there were many others that existed, but they didn't, uh, you know, they didn't call themselves, the, the name of the organization didn't refer to race. So I, I left those out, but I came up with a list of about 120. And I put them on my website in the form of a graphic, and I called it the 100, um, 100 largest racist groups in America, kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing. Yes. But, uh, so we have all these black affinity groups. Which, by the way, I have no problem with them if they want to form, you know, I believe in freedom of association. And I believe in advocating your interests. Nothing wrong with that. The problem is blacks can do it, but white people can't. Muslims can do it, but Christians can't. Um, East Asians can do it, and I'm glad that they can. They should be able to. But so should white people. Absolutely. Why can we not have... Uh, well, to go back to your place of safety, why can we not have a white place of safety? Uh, are they wanting 
to go back to racism. I mean, they were the ones who protested sitting in the back of the bus and whites only here and whites only there. But they are the ones who want to bring it back as blacks only. But it's the same thing, is it not? Yeah, it's the same thing. What we have to keep in mind is they're going to find racism somewhere, somehow. There's nothing we can say or do that will eradicate racism from their perspective because they have to find it because that is the fuel that uh, that drives them. It Absolutely. will always, always, always be there. If there is one white person left on the earth, they will still accuse that person of being a racist. And when that person is dead and gone, long after he's dead and gone, they will still blame all the uh, woes and, and the challenges and difficulties on white people. Absolutely. That's just the way they do it. You just have to look at South Africa. I mean, the blacks have been in charge for 21 years. And yet still, to this day, everything is the fault of the whites, who are less than an 8% minority in that country. So how is it possible that that little, little, small, endangered minority is responsible for such enormous crime and and horrible oppression. And those those poor whites are not oppressing that majority of blacks. And yet, if they did not have the, 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 the white hate to focus on, if that white group disappeared, what you said about America earlier, those blacks would then be killing each other as they were before we got to South, to South Africa and stopped it. Well, the troubling thing about what you say, Karen, is the fact that that never occurs to anybody. I mean, there are millions of black people. Surely some of them would stop and consider, you know what? If all the white people in South Africa were to abruptly disappear, where would we be? Uh, They would be back to paleolithic existence. They'd be back to living in grass huts. Mm. But it never occurs to them. I don't know why. You know, you would think that somebody would be intelligent enough, and maybe they do. There, there some people there may be able to think to, uh, to be reasonable enough to rationalize that it were it not for white people, would be in serious trouble. But as it is now in South Africa, if, if there's a pothole in the street, it's because of the apartheid. Yes. You know, yes. And, uh, if there's crime among blacks, it's because of apartheid. And yet you you also, uh, Ken, you maintain a, a, a list of black on white crime and you print them. Now, the mainstream does not talk about those things. I saw a, a one that you put up this morning uh, that you will never hear about in the mainstream, all these crimes that happened in the last week uh, in America, black on white. It's the same thing in South Africa because they never, ever say a white person was killed by this gang of blacks. And it's always a gang. It's never a lone black person who attacks an 84-year-old grandmother. It's always four or six or eight of them that attack an, a frail elderly person in their bed, you know. But the the pictures put out on on uh, South African news, if, if ever they talk about it, is always a pair of white hands handcuffed, although the white is the victim. So this conditioning of us, to accept that we are wrong all the time is blatantly obvious to anybody who wants to look. The problem is they, they're perfectly happy not to look. They want to pretend that it's otherwise. Now, that's delusion. In my thinking, if you are in denial of reality, you've got a mental problem. Um, that's psychosis. You know, we, we mm-hmm. live in a world that doesn't exist. It's it's a mental illness. But the way they uh, contend with that, they say, if you believe the truth, if you tell the truth, you're the one who's whack. You mm-hmm. have a mental problem. And so they turn it exactly backwards. Um, to give you an example of what you're talking about, I posted a story. I think I posted it this morning. Yeah, there was a 21-year-old kid, and he lived in a... Uh, suburban area of Philadelphia. I think he actually lived in the city, but it's, uh, you know, near the uh, edge of the town, edge of the city, 21 years old. Early morning of Thanksgiving, he decided he would walk down to the convenience store, get him something to eat, come home. And 21-year-old kid, he lived with his mom. His mom said, you know, you really shouldn't be out tonight, but he assured her he'd be okay. 
So he went down to the store and got whatever, probably got Skittles, came home. But uh, just before he got to his uh, house, his mother heard a loud banging sound. She looked outside, saw her son that like dead on the sidewalk. And two black guys getting in a car driving away. And as I read that story, I'm thinking, why is that not national news? You know, a couple of years ago, Trayvon Martin went to mm-hmm. the store. He mm-hmm. had skittles. And he attacked somebody. And George Zimmerman defended himself and shot Trayvon Martin dead. And that was national news for, you know, for months, over a year. Oh, and my Trayvon goodness. Trayvon Martin's mother was made a martyr. Yes. She was made a celebrity. But this story... And the guy wasn't killed in self-defense. They were robbing the guy. Mm-hmm. But you never hear about it. And that's one of many. Uh, I think I identified 27 of those types of stories that occurred that were in local news this week. And those are just the ones I found. There, there are probably 100 more that I, that I wasn't, able, wasn't able to find or didn't have the time to post. You know, you could actually hire a team of people to research black on white crime full time they still wouldn't find all the stories no because ken nobody talks about them you know yes yes certain of them do get published a small paragraph in the local news but how many of them are go totally unreported totally because in south africa the the, the theory is that only 50 percent of crimes are reported to the police because uh, so many of them are done by the police, and nobody trusts the police. And Interpol said that of of that 50% that are reported to the police, the police underreport another 50%. So if you take the actual crime figures and double them, you might come to some kind of uh, approximately correct number. Now, what has happened to our world that these things are accepted as fine? It's fine to lie to the people all the time. The um, the thing that boggles my mind about South Africa is the fact that we are currently in a stage of bringing uh, literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of refugees yes. from Syria and from the Middle East, all of whom are Muslims. And if there's any objection, Hillary will go on television and say we hate these uh, widows and orphans. Yeah, wearing a burqa herself. I mean, really, really. And I'm wondering, why are we not bringing in refugees from South Africa? And if we did, would Hillary say, well, let's welcome these widows and orphans? I don't think so. Not a chance, because America has given. Now, they probably are more, but I know in one month, In fact, November last year, they gave refugee status to 320 black South Africans. Now, I have not heard of one white South African being given refugee status in this country. So what are those blacks in the mind of the the American government? What are those blacks refugees from? Well, obviously, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm sure they they can call it something. But the objective, again, is to destroy Western culture. They really don't care about black people. They never have. But something interesting came out uh, in the news a couple weeks ago. And that is the fact that the number of Mexicans migrating to the United States is not only... uh, um, I can't say that it stopped, but the number of uh, Mexicans immigrating out of the country is actually higher than the numbers coming in. So it started to reverse itself. It's as if uh, there are no more Mexicans coming in by counting the uh, the net increase in uh, Latinos in the country. I say Mexicans, I shouldn't say Latinos. Mm -hmm. And so how are they going to destroy overwhelmed Western culture when they have uh, maxed out on Latinos, on Hispanics coming into the country? Which I'm not sure that it has, but uh, it appears that it has. Well, they have to find non-white somewhere else. Mm. And somewhere Mm. else is the Middle East. And uh, here they come by the hundreds of thousands. And they're using refugee status as an excuse. And they're saying, if you oppose these guys coming in, you're opposed to widows and orphans. I've seen pictures of them. Uh, You know, I published it on my website, particularly in Europe, in Germany, in uh, you know, in Greece and 
those countries where you see hordes of young men, no yeah. widows and orphans. Yeah, all these widows and orphans have beards. It's amazing, and they're all six feet tall. Exactly. <laughs> Exactly, and they're not exactly uh, starving like Biafrans. Their bones are not sticking out. They, they've got nice, clean clothes. They've got cell phones. They've got uh, data on their cell phones. Uh, refugees, excuse me. Yeah, I published a story. I, man, I can't, I can't remember what country it was in, but I think it was in Belgium. And the merchants uh, at a shopping mall, the retailers were complaining because these refugees were coming in with their cell phones, and they were they were there, not to shop, but to take advantage of the free Wi-Fi. Yes. And their very presence, the fact that they were loitering and they were noisy, whatever, were running off paying customers. But what really frustrated some of the shop owners were these uh, these poor refugees, these widows and orphans with beards. <laughs> they, they have a look at their smartphones and they, you know, some of them, the iPod 6 or iPad 6, whatever it is, I'm not technically astute, but whatever it was they were using, the shopkeepers were saying, man, we can't afford those things. So these guys have uh, have money enough that they don't have to work. Yes. All they do is loiter. Yes. And cause trouble. Um, Can it you know, what's up with that? It would appear that we are not going to have our top of the hour advert. So what I'm going to do in order to give us a chance to get a cup of tea is play a song, which will give us four minutes. We'll be back. I can see myself. It's a golden sunrise. I'm good. Open up your eyes. It's supposed to be your day. Now off you go. Rise and bound. And you won't stop. Your own kind of way, and the wind will whip your tousled hair, the sun, the rain, the sweet despair, great tales of love and strife. And somewhere on your path to glory, you will write your story of a life. And all the towns that you walk through, and all the people.
time is patched in your tinted rhyme. March to your drum and fire. But the question echoes out before me where's my magic story of a life? And we're back. You're listening to Radio Free South Africa on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. That is my absolute favorite song by Sunette Bridges, a well-known South African activist who writes and plays her own music, which unfortunately is banned in South Africa. She is also responsible for writing our intro music, which is an Afrikaans song, which translated into English means enough. Um, she is an absolutely fantastic singer and activist and adds the South African flavor to this program. Once again, you're listening to Radio Free South Africa, and our guest today is Ken Gibberton. Hi, Ken. Welcome back. Well, you know, it's good to be back. I was thinking during the, uh, during the break, the hypocrisy of white liberals, like all white privileged liberals, um, they are so concerned, they say, about the plight of uh, black people in America, and I'm glad they are. We should care about each other. I mean, after all, we're, we're all related some way. But the same white liberals who are so concerned about the plight of poor black Americans live in white neighborhoods. <laughs> and, yes. Uh, you know, I yes. live, I call it a Jim Crow neighborhood. It's kind of a tongue of cheek. But I live in a neighborhood where all my neighbors, with few exceptions, are white. We have some friends who are Koreans, but uh, um, there may be a black family. I've seen blacks come through the neighborhood now and again, but they're all white. But when you see white liberals living in isolation in exclusive white neighborhoods, you have to wonder, are these people really sincere when they talk about their concern about uh, the plight of poor black people, and they talk about their their uh, affinity with groups like um, Black Lives Matter. Yes. But you can't get them to go into a black neighborhood. Uh, they, you know, there, there's no way they're going to move into a black housing project so they can spread around their white privilege. It's kind of a mind game they're playing with themselves. They are pretending that they care when, in reality, they don't care. They have no idea. You know, I grew up in an urban area. I went to a, a majority black high school. It was kind of like South Africa, <laughs> you know, for four years, uh, a few hours a day. And, you know, what we, what I saw and experienced was totally different from what I would see and experience on television or I didn't, when I was a kid, I never went to the movies, but uh, what I knew that was on the theater. And there was one movie in particular, uh, I can't remember when it was produced back in the 1940s, called To Kill a Mockingbird. Yes. And everyone knows the story because they are forced to uh, read it when they're in school, in government schools. And it's uh, basically a novel that is a, a, it's a white guilt story. It's, you know, again, I hate to use the term brainwashing, but that's what it is. It's an abject denial of reality. It's the, the whole purpose of the movie and the book upon which it was based is to convince white people that uh, we have been falsely accusing all these black men of committing rape. And when they are accused of doing that, we should immediately be sympathetic toward them. So we know, you know, we're, they, they're innocent, no proven guilty. Nobody has a problem with that. But the predatory left wants us to think and to believe that many of these black men who have raped and sometimes murdered uh, white women are really innocent. But the fact of the matter is, they're just not. Some of them are, and that's why they have a free trial. But the point of all of that is that, again, our minds are being conditioned to reject reality. And I published a story on my website. Again, I think I put this one up this morning. I keep forgetting when I put things up. I know I did that. But there are several occasions where black men have raped and murdered white women. And the media is totally silent about it. But more disturbing is the so-called feminist movement won't say anything about it whatsoever. There was one woman, Karen, who was, uh, she was 26 
years old. She was uh, a lab assistant of some kind. She lived, if I recall, in Virginia. And she lived in an apartment. And she came home one night, and she didn't know it, but there was a black guy in her apartment who was, uh, well, he was a burglar. He was stealing things. This was 37 years ago. She surprised him. And so this guy took a, um, what do you call it, a poker from the fireplace? Yeah. And beat her with it, strangled her with it, raped her, and then murdered her and left her for dead. It was 37 years ago. They just caught the guy the last week. So for 37 years, he's been free. But that type of crime goes on. It occurs all the time. And we're ignoring it. I can't think of one instance. And, and keep in mind, this happens multiple times every day. I can't think of one instance where a white man has raped a black woman. I'm sure it's happened at some point in time, but uh, I don't know of any. Exactly. And Ken, you know, there's a, a very, very active uh, activist in South Africa, Natasha, and she does the Stop White Genocide uh, webpage. Now, she publishes every month how many attacks, how many murders we, we, we can quantify because, as, as you know, uh, there are many that we don't, we are unable to find or that are not published or whatever. And she also publishes how many white on black rapes and murders that month. And for this entire year, I have not found one white on black, only black on white and black on black. Well, once more, you find that there's almost no white-on-white uh, -white crime. I mean, there's some, but not very much. The, uh, the fact of the matter is that, uh, according to statisticians and psychologists, about 1% of the human race are psycho uh, psychopathic. That is to say, they have no empathy. Uh, their brains are so configured that they know right from wrong, they just don't care. And so those things are bound to happen, but, uh, and, and, you know, that thought triggers another thought in my mind. There are what, um, one point, I think there's 1.6 billion Muslims in the world. And if 1% of those yes. were psychopaths, yes. yes, I can't do the math in my head, but, uh, that's what, uh, 100 million Muslim psychopaths we have to contend with that that's a real problem that's a little bit off topic what we were talking about the thought it, came to my mind that thought triggers another thought no absolutely ken and that that is very important because you know every time they uh, we, we're we're always wondering you and i but we have wonderful chats so um every time there there is violence they blame the guns um but but this latest one is uh, um, <laughs> it can't be blamed on the guns because they are the strictest gun laws ever in California. So if you take that 1% of violent, psychopathic Muslims, you, are you telling me that if I put up a sign saying, no guns allowed, they're going to turn around and say, oh, sorry, gee, I'm at the wrong place. No, you can't blame the guns for that 1% of violent psychopaths. Well, you got to consider that uh, when these uh, these two newlyweds, Muslims, these uh, what would you call them? Um, you, you can't call them militants because they were so normal. So they're terrorists. Uh, they are terrorists. There's no two ways about yeah, it. They're terrorists. But uh, anyhow, they were. Uh, there was nothing about them that any rational person would consider terrorist if they are effectively brainwashed by the by the media. Yes. But the story emerged that uh, their neighbors were very much aware of the fact that they were carrying on some weird uh, weird behavior patterns. They were receiving packages. They were working late uh, into the night in their garage. The neighbors observed this. And the story emerged that their neighbors feared contacting the uh, authorities. You know why? They were afraid of being labeled racist or Islamophobes. Now, what what happened in this country that uh, predicated that? Well, a few weeks ago, there was this kid in Texas 
or invented a clock or, or made a clock and it looked like a bomb. And uh, those who raised the alarm and called authorities were ridiculed. And this kid was invited to the White House, even. And the president took a part in ridiculing those who had the audacity to even consider that a Muslim who made a device that looked exactly like a bomb should be brought into question. Yes. Yes. And so we are being intimidated to silence. And that's exactly what predicated the event in San Bernardino. Their neighbors knew they were up to something, but they didn't want to be like the people who accused the clock boy of, uh, you know, and embarrassed themselves, so they kept quiet. And the result, as a result of that, 14 people are now dead. And those 14 people, the group, I don't know how many were in the room, uh, I think I heard maybe 80, they were soft targets because, as you know, they weren't armed. They didn't have handguns. And I will guarantee you that if that guy who committed the crime, the uh, the Muslim, the moderate Muslim who committed the crime of terror, moderate was the word I was trying to find a minute ago, uh, he knew those people, and he knew they did not carry arms. They knew He knew they didn't have handguns. He knew the laws in the state of California. And so he knew they were soft targets. Yes. Yes. And if he knew some of those guys were carrying guns, I'll guarantee you that that event never would have happened. Well, exactly. And and that is, that is why one of the, almost one of the first things that the ANC did in South Africa was to disarm the populace and disband the militia. Well, the commandos, which were... Um, a group of people who protected the farmers because by nature farms are isolated from towns. So the, the ANC government knew that, that the only way to, well, the quickest way to make victims out of white people was to disarm them. So they did. And now, and now the blacks know that if they break into your house and, and, and keep you the captive there for days on end and murder, rape, torture, burn, set alight, uh, they're not going to have any retaliation from the home owners because they know that by law they are disarmed. And in South Africa, if you do defend yourself in your own home, you are the one who will be charged with murder or culpable homicide or some such thing. And the, 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 the person, you will become the perpetrator instead of the victim. And the guy who, the criminal who actually is to blame for it, will be let away scot-free. And that is the, the direct result of gun-free. So why are we allowing it here? Well, one has to wonder how many terrorist attacks like the one we saw in San Bernardino could have happened, would have happened, in areas where people carry guns, had those people not been armed? We don't know. That's a hypothetical. It's a counterfactual. We, there's no way we can determine that. But we have to, if we're rational people, we have to draw the conclusion that there have been a lot of uh, terrorist attacks that did not occur because people were armed. Yes. And when we disarm Americans, uh, those attacks are going to increase and be substantial. But, you know, Karen, I don't understand why, uh, well, I do understand, but I, I think it's irrational that Islam is not considered a hate group. You know, again, uh, in 20, 30 years, I don't think the Klan has uh, committed any act that could possibly be considered terror. I think the most recent one was 1964 that I can recall, and that wasn't a Klan uh attack. It was members of the Klan who did the uh, attacking. That was that church in uh, can't remember. I think it was in Birmingham where the four little girls were killed. But uh, it just doesn't happen. But yet we consider the Klan a hate group. But we don't consider Islam a hate group. And they have uh, perpetuated 27,000 uh, over 27,000 terrorist attacks since 2011. Since 9 11 two, or 2001 rather. 9 11 2001. But we embrace them. We consider this massive hate group, this terrorist organization with 1.57 billion members, the Democrats and the liberals embrace them as the oppressed. How crazy is that? That's totally insane. 
Yeah. But again, uh, that that onset mental illness uh, is just totally irrational thinking. But we're letting him get away with it. Again, for me, uh, a friend of mine who's also a, a show host, she says it's, it's, it's the upside down world. And I do believe that because writers become wrong and, and, and you have to turn everything you hear in the mainstream upside down and shake it severely to get that, that one little kernel of truth out of it. And it's frightening to me how in such a short while the world has turned that way. Because when I was young, right was right and wrong was wrong. And we had a very strong sense of both. Everybody knew right and wrong. Nowadays, nothing is wrong. Nothing. Yeah. Well, that takes us back to the media. Um, you know, I recall when I was... Uh, you know, maybe eight, ten years old, we would watch westerns on television. Mm. Black and white, Roy Rogers, uh, those types. Yes, yes. <laughs> and the plot was always predictable. Uh, the, white, the, the good guy wore a white hat, mm -hmm. the bad guy wore a black hat, and uh, the, white, the, uh, the good guys outnumbered the bad guys. And the good guys always won. And there was always a moral story to every episode, and that is truth prevails, honesty prevails. Yes. The bad yes. guys will be punished. And I don't think um, the media was intentionally trying to bring them. It's just, I think that was just uh, how Western culture thought at that time. Well, the media understood the difference. Yes. The power of the media to change our minds, mm -hmm. and they are doing that. I don't know if I told you the story about the uh, about the uh, Betty Crocker episode. No. But there was a, uh, a time when, uh, I'm trying to think of a company that makes the uh, Betty Crocker cake mix, doesn't come to mind, but whatever that company is, they had devised back in the 1950s uh, instant cake mix, which, uh, you know, before that, it took hours to make a cake and from so scratch. They had a yes. Product. As soon as this would uh, hit the shelves, they thought the uh, American housewife would snatch it up. Well, they didn't do it. They came up with this super product, and nobody was buying it. And so they did some research, and they wondered why. And they discovered that uh, the typical American housewife felt guilty about making a cake that they didn't have to work for. Yes. And having done research um, and interviewing so many women, they finally occurred to them that they would have to make some change to the uh, cake mix. And what they did was they changed the recipe that you would put in the cake mix and you would add an egg. Yes. We say egg in Indiana. Everyone else says egg or whatever. <laughs> and that little bit of difference uh, took away the guilt. And from that point forward, the Betty Crocker cake and some cake mix sales soared. The point of that is this. Uh, the media use psychology to get inside the heads of the American housewife. Yes. And by understanding how she thought, they were able to come up with a product that she would buy. So what we, what we take away from that is this. We act out what we believe. For example, uh, I'm sitting in my office right now. And the reason I don't get up and run out is because I believe my office is not on fire. So I'm acting out what I believe. And what I believe is the office is not on fire. So if I believe the office was on fire, that would affect my behavior and I would get up and run out. And so whatever it is that we believe, we act out what we believe. That's, that's a universal truth. So yes. whatever it is we believe is reflected in our behavior. Mm -hmm. And so the media controls our behavior by controlling what we believe. And it affects our thinking process. And we don't realize it, but every time we sit down and watch television, we're going to the cinema. They're infecting our minds with what I call the cultural Marxism virus. Yes. And we don't even know it. Yes. But, uh, you know, I don't go to movies and I almost never watch television, but uh, my wife does. And sometimes I will be walking through the living room while the TV's on, which is uh, 
not, not often, but sometimes it is. I mean, even that brief segment of time, which may be 10 seconds, I can't help but to notice <laughs> the, uh, the intensity of cultural Marxism in that short period of time. You cannot look at television without seeing both uh, 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 multiculturalism. Yes. It's just there. You know, you turn on your TV right now, you're going to see it. Yes. And it's uh, it's pervasive. And they do that by design. It's on purpose. Here's here's a trivia question for you. Uh, do you remember the uh, TV show that was on in the 60s, uh, Mayberry RFD or Andy Griffith show? Do you remember that? No, Ken, because in South Africa during that time, we were cut off from everything from the outside world, and we got TV very, very late um, because our government considered it subversive and uh, that it would definitely brainwash people. And so we got TV very, very late uh, in South Africa. We had radio during that time, so no TV, and very few um, even when we've got TV, very few uh, external uh, TV programs because we we were being boycotted. So we didn't have those things. I see. Well, what was interesting about that particular show is it was considered a family-oriented show and uh, very popular, high in the ratings. Was uh, somebody observed one time that of all the characters in the show, and I'm sure your listeners are familiar with it, uh, somebody asked, well, who on that show is married? And, you know, you stop and think about it, and, well, the, the main characters were the sheriff. He wasn't married. Uh, he had a girlfriend. And his uh -huh. deputy, he wasn't married. Barney Fife, uh, he had a girlfriend. Uh -huh. And you went through the list of all the characters, and none of them were married. The, the family life was non-existent. The only exception was the town drunk. He had a wife. <laughs> that, that is it in the entire show. Nobody, it never occurred to anybody. But there was a thing, in, and uh, your listeners can Google this, it's called the Rural Purge. It happened on yes. television in yes. the 1969-1970. Uh, the most popular shows on television were shows like the Beverly Hillbillies, uh, Green Acres. They were family-oriented shows. A lot of them focused on, uh, you know, rural living. And those shows were abruptly canceled, every single one of them, 1969-1970, that season, and they were replaced with multicultural programming. Yeah. You can't tell me that was not by design. It was intentional. And it's amazing because some of those shows, like Mayberry RFD, the other group of show with uh, Green Acres and uh, Petticoat Junction was another, another one. They were good, wholesome family shows. And some of them were doing very well in the ratings. But the TV executive said, ostensibly, that they weren't reaching younger audiences, which I don't think is true. I think that was a red herring. But they just canceled all those shows, even though they were highly, some of them were highly profitable and people loved them. But the reason they did that, in my mind, was because they wanted to begin infecting our minds with cultural Marxism. Yes, I agree. Holy, I yeah, fully, yeah, fully agree with you. Producers like a Norman Lear came on the scene and all of his garbage started showing up. And they tested a few of them and people watched them. And so we absorbed that cultural Marxism, but we did not even realize what they were teaching us. But we accepted it, you know. And it's, uh, it's becoming more and more intense. And so I don't even like to watch... Uh, I don't even like to watch television. Sometimes I watch the old 1960s sitcoms, uh, even though they're kind of dumb, but uh, I don't like to watch them because you get to see those old cars in pristine condition sometimes. But uh, those are the only shows on TV worth watching, but even when you get to the commercials, uh, the commercials are laden with cultural Marxism. Yes, yes. Um, what? Absolutely, Ken, absolutely. And... and, and uh, you know, sex sells everything. Well, my husband and I were talking this morning about the difference between advertising in South Africa and advertising here. And uh, it is so different, you wouldn't recognize it. Because we, yes, we do use that pretty girl to sell that car in South Africa. But there's a whole different way of advertising there than there is here. And, and they use... Uh, <sighs> 
the acceptable story, black on white and sex and, and, and blatant sex, uh, to, to advertise here. And it's actually awful. It is horrible that the world, and especially us, because our generation is responsible for allowing this to happen. It, it, it's just so not right that our kids are exposed to this day in and day out. I have two very, very young granddaughters and a tiny little grandson, and they are exposed to stuff that, that my parents wouldn't even allow to be talked about in our house. And don't you find that awful that their minds are full of this kind of thing when they're too young to, to deal with it? Well, as we talked about earlier in the conversation, that is the uh, that's the new normal. Um, during one of my brief uh, passes by the television set, I noticed there was a uh, I think it was a Campbell Soup commercial, and there was this little kid, like a little preschooler, and his parents were uh, taking turns uh, feeding him soup. And the one guy said, I'm your daddy. And the other guy said, no, I'm your daddy. Ah. And this was obviously homosexual parents. Yes. So that was a commercial. That wasn't the show. Yes. And nobody objects. We just accept it. And you know, I mentioned earlier the aggressive insurance commercial where um, um, Flo is the, the character of those commercials was uh, denigrating the uh, 1950s housewife, the subservient, and, you know, white males were dominant, evil. That's what they're teaching us in commercials. And if, they're, if they can get away with that in commercials, you know they're getting away with it in the uh, programming. But I noticed a couple of years ago that uh, as, I was, uh, as, as you would see a commercial on TV, in the matter of a split second, literally, you know, less than a second, they would uh, show the image of a little child who appeared to be biracial, but you couldn't tell because it went by so quickly. But then I noticed in a few months uh, that would increase. And so it was a split second, it would be a couple seconds. And then it would go on and you would see uh, interracial couples. You know, I believe in freedom of association. You can be with whoever you want to be. That's not the issue. The issue is that the media is forcing it upon us whether we like it or not. Yes. The way I like to explain that is uh, something that I really like is pizza. But my wife and I went out for pizza last night. Uh, we do that, I think, once a week. But if somebody were to uh, force feed me a pizza, I would resist, even though I like it. I don't want to be force fed. Mm -hmm. The same thing applies to the uh, cinema and television and other media. Uh, outlets, because even though I may like what they're doing or don't disagree with what they're doing, I don't want to be force-fed it, but they are forcing it upon us, and your little grandkids, that's going to be their normal, unless they're taught otherwise. So you have the wisdom, and their parents have the wisdom to teach them, but of the millions of little children in the United States today, how many parents are going to do that? Well, almost none. Yes. And so the next generation, uh, that will be the new normal. Uh, when I was a kid, Karen, I didn't even know homosexuality existed. No. You know, but now it's uh, it's force-fed to us. We're, we're supposed to accept it. We have to learn about it. And They're teaching it in schools, happening. for heaven's sake. Uh, Ken, you know, it, it was during my lifetime. Uh, when the argument started whether sex should be taught in schools at all. And now they're teaching these other forms of sex, perverted forms, to our young, young, young children whose minds cannot encompass it. They are not mature enough to deal with these things. So what is to become of those children? I, I, I just, I don't understand it. My parents would not discuss these things openly in our house unless you went into a little corner and a huddle with your mom and talked to her about these things. That It was not a subject that was suitable for the dinner table, for instance. And now, at the dinner table, it's forced on you if you're watching TV. It's gross and disgusting. But we have allowed it because that one person stood up <coughs> and complained about um, 
the pledge being said in schools. And because of one person doing that, we allowed it to be taken away. We allowed Christianity to be taken out of schools and everywhere else. And slowly but surely, they eroded decency. So we are as much to blame as the mainstream is. I think you're accurate. Uh, you know, it comes to mind that there's a thing called normalcy bias where we don't expect things to change and the predatory yes. left takes advantage of that. Yes. And so they will encroach upon us in incremental bits mm. of uh, mm. And we don't even know what's happening until we're overwhelmed and then it's uh, too late. You know, I hate to use the illustration, just the proverbial frog boiling in water, slowly boiling. Yes. And we don't yes. know what happens till we're, till we're cooked. And then it's too late to jump out. And I think we are in that position. But uh, fortunately, there's still a lot of good people out there. Somebody put a note on my uh, Facebook page today and he was looking for an organization a group of uh, people that were pro-white, but there weren't nut cases, because it seems like every organization out there are, I call them neo-nutsies. Yes, neo-nutsies. yes. They're totally loons. Um, that, that's the only people that are organizing. Yes. And uh, he saw that. He wondered, you know, is there anybody out there that uh, he can trust, that uh, he can work with? And so maybe the time has come to, uh, you know, for white folks to get together and say, look, we're not racist, we're not neo-nutsies. We're not Ku Klux Klansters, we're none of that, but uh, we have a right to form affinity groups and to voice uh, our opinions and to stand up for ourselves. And of course, as soon as you do that immediately, they're going to call you racist and they'll go ahead and call you neo-Nazis anyhow. Yes. You know, the resistance in Europe to uh, the insurgency of Islam, uh, that whole movement, that whole patriotic movement, is uh, roundly criticized as being neo-Nazis or Nazis. And here's what they do. They, they divide us. And again, it's like dividing between people of color and white people. Mm-hmm. But they divide us between nationalist and globalist, which mm-hmm. I think is accurate. You know, if you're not one, you have to be the other. So if you're not a globalist, that means you must be a nationalist. I mean, you could be an imperialist or you could be a tribalist, but I think, you know, that was, that's just kind of silly. So if you're not a globalist, you're a nationalist. Well, then I'm a nationalist, and I am, because I believe in nations, as opposed to a global world economy or global government. So I'm a nationalist. Well, what the bad guys do is they say, well, if you're a nationalist, you're a Nazi. Yes. (laughs) Yes. How how crazy is that? It's plain silly. Uh, But people believe that. They say, well, I don't want to be a Nazi, so I guess I'll be a globalist. And uh, so they're globalists, and then nobody criticizes them. Nobody makes fun of them. Nobody calls them names. They treat them like that is normal, and that becomes their belief system. And again, we act out what we believe. And so that is a, that is a dawning problem that uh, they're having to contend with in Europe, and I'm assuming in South Africa, that is that if you don't go along with culta, multiculturalism and globalism, they're going to demonize you and ostracize you. They're going to make a fool out of you. They're going to call you a racist, a, national, uh, a Nazi, rather, or some other pejorative. But and they're getting away with it. But, Ken, the problem in South Africa, um, which which is going to come to the rest of the world, because you were talking about Loretta Lynch earlier, um, going to penalize people and sue people who speak out against Islam. So in South Africa, they have made these over 120 race-based laws, literally making it a crime to be white. Um, you, You have no access to the workplace. You have no access to charity. You have no access to government grants. You have no access to anything because you are white. So it's coming to the rest of the world. And it's not just a word anymore. It's not you're a Nazi or you're a racist. It's actually in the law that it is essentially a crime to be a white person. You, you, being born white is a crime. And, and it's coming to the rest of the world. But as I said in the beginning, it's not creeping up on the world uh, like it did in South Africa. Because you said as well that you kind of become desensitized and you don't see what's happening because it happens in small increments. So in South Africa, an illustration of that 
is you, you used to live with your doors open and a, it, the, the white picket fence kind of thing. And slowly but surely, you had to build an eight-foot wall around your house. And then you had to put an electric wiring on top of that wall. And then you had to put in an electric gate. And then you had to put burglar bars on all the windows. And then you had to have security doors, not only on your back and front door that lead to the outside, but inside the house to close off your sleeping quarters from the rest of the house. And then you had to put in an alarm system. And then you had to connect that alarm system to an instant response people. And it crept upon you so slowly that you actually are living in a fortress, in a prison built by yourself, where you imprison yourself, and you didn't notice it happening. And now it's normal to live like that. That is uh, yeah, a thing we have to keep in mind about South Africa from an American perspective is that it's a harbinger of what is going to come here and is really already happening. Yes. As, as the, uh, the white population becomes a smaller percentage of the national population, the, uh, the thing we have to keep in mind is that if you go to uh, any area of the world, any nation of the world that is uh, primarily white, you will find the crime rate is extremely low. For example, I think the only uh, all, the only majority white nation in Latin America that I can think of is Uruguay, and Uruguay is a is a uh, vacation destination for uh, people in Brazil and around South America because it has an extremely low crime rate. There is nothing in Uruguay that is any more appealing than anywhere else in, in South America. I mean, it doesn't have beautiful scenery. It doesn't have particularly great beaches relative to other areas. But the thing that is appealing about Uruguay is you can go there on vacation and not worry about getting carjacked when you're uh, driving down the highway or getting mugged when you're walking down the street because yeah. crime just doesn't exist there in the, in the uh, as it does around the world. And I believe, and you get in trouble when you say this, but it's true, I think it's genetic. You know, the most prosperous area in South America, it's not a nation technically, but uh, the, one of the most pro prosperous areas in South America with the highest standard of living also has the highest cost of living, and that is the uh, Falkland Islands. And the reason is they're white people. Yes. You know, it, it's uh, a protectorate of Britain. But you have 2,000 or so people who are living in isolation on these islands, and they have made themselves extremely prosperous, and there is virtually no crime there whatsoever. I think uh, they have a little jail. They have maybe a handful of police officers, and if somebody's in jail, it's probably because he got drunk or something. You know, that's it. Yes. The uh, crime rate on the Isle of Man, the same thing. It's virtually non-existent. But you know in Iceland, in the history of Iceland, the entire history of Iceland, there has been only one police shooting that has resulted in death. Only one. That was, I think, two years ago. Wow. You know, because white people just don't go around killing each other. We're, we're not criminals. Um, we, we have a problem with wars, but uh, as far as street crime, it just doesn't happen. Mm -mm. And so if you go to Iceland or the Isle of Man or Uruguay or the Falkland Islands or my neighborhood, what you don't see is you don't see those walls built around people's houses. You don't see the electric uh, gate. You don't see the barbed wire on top of the walls. My house, I've got it surrounded by an eight-foot wall because I like privacy. Mm -hmm. You have nothing to do with crime. But, uh, you know, in Europe, Karen, they have what is called uh, no-go zones. And the police will not go in those areas. Yes. Because if they do, they'll be attacked. Yes. We have those so, in South Africa, too. Uh, you won't believe it. I mean, it's a black country, and yet the, the no-go zones in South Africa are black neighborhoods, black areas. The police have been told in South Africa, now, no, no, this is unbelievable, that they should not risk their lives. They should turn around and run away. Do not risk your life in those areas. In fact, don't go there. But it's all, the police are black and the area is black, but it's a no-go zone for them. It, 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 it is ridiculous, Ken, totally ridiculous. There's not a white area in South Africa that's a no-go zone. And I, I know you've heard about Orania, 
which is a white town in South Africa, all white, and there is no crime. They don't even have police or a jail cell in that town because there is no crime whatsoever in one of the most crime-ridden countries in the world. I like to uh, refer to my neighborhood as a no-go zone because the police never come here. But it's not because they're afraid to, it's because they have no reason to. Mm. So they mm. just don't come through. Um, yes, you know, the, the, yes. The dispute is if somebody's weeds go in somebody's yard. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's no problem with break-ins, there's no problem with, uh, certainly no problem with homicide. But this doesn't happen, so the police have no reason to come in here. I think the... Uh, the last big deal we had in our neighborhood is when our, our dryer caught on fire. <laughs> and why, why in the world the fire department had to bring out the uh, hook and ladder truck is beyond me. For it. You know, we live in a one-story house. Well, I guess it's their policy. Whenever there's a fire call, they have to bring all their equipment out. So yes. Big deal. Yes. We'll, we'll get our dryer on fire. But, but it, it, it is the deal. truth. It is the absolute truth. Ken, that white people in general, they are always bad apples in any barrel. I mean, we can't pretend that there are no bad white people. We also have our psychopaths and our mass murderers, etc. We do. But in general, white people uh, are, are law-abiding, um, just happy to live their own lives quietly, peacefully and get on with it. We we don't need to take to the streets and burn and loot. And I mean, if, if you look at some, a white person is killed, do we take to the streets and turn the, set the whole town alight? No, we don't. No, we hold hands and burn candles. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Absolutely. We have a vigil for that person and pray and, and sing hymns. You know, I, I, and the things that have happened in South Africa that have spread here, um, like the the protests and the riots at the universities and the Black Lives Matter, etc., it all started in South Africa. The 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 statues being removed and human feces being thrown at them and looting and I mean what happened in Ferguson it always amazes me that South Africa that America is such a big country um with so much variety and so much different and yet Ferguson still hit the news as a huge incident in South Africa those things happen every single day, the riots, the looting, the burning, and nobody pays attention because we've become desensitized and consider that the norm. I was told the other day, and I can't prove this figure, so, but you know, I'm just putting it out there, that there are 50 protests and riots and strikes in South Africa every day. Now, if you had 50 Fergusons in America in one day, can you imagine the uproar? Well, like you say, it just becomes normal. It's just a part of the uh, daily life, daily routine. You just kind of drive around it and uh, try to ignore it. Uh, when I was in high school, violence was part of it. And you just learn to stay away from it. Mm. Mm. You learn very quickly to stay away from it. But that was uh, that was just part of daily life. You know, you go to school, you confront the uh, black on white violence. You know, then you go to class and you learn that white people are evil. Um, there was a uh, there was a divergence, a contradiction, and some of us had enough sense to see through it. Uh, but you know, Karen, if you go to um, through East Asian countries, you find the same thing. Is they are they're primarily law abiding people. There there just aren't a lot of uh, violent crimes being committed in Japan. There just aren't uh, much of China. The same way, uh, there, there's not a lot of street violence. You can go almost anywhere late at night and not have to worry about it. I mean, there, there still is a problem, but it's not as severe as in black neighborhoods yet in South Africa or anywhere else in the country. Uh, I posted a video on my website earlier this week of a uh, of a, a store. It was a security video taken in a store in Finland, and there was this uh, young woman. I'm guessing she's probably in her early twenties, and 
said there were a couple of uh, refugees, but that in quotes, a couple of black guys came in and they just uh, walked out with stuff. <laughs> you know, they just helped themselves. Yep. And this girl yes. tackled him. She went and grabbed him and, you know, <coughs> and one of the guys took him to the ground. I was kind of amazed, got the stuff back, but that happened several times. But the point is, when shoplifting occurs, uh, typically in black neighborhoods, it is uh, what I call slow burn, rioting, slow burn, looting. Uh, it's no different from looting. It just doesn't happen as fast. But there is a reason why they say there are no grocery store chains in Detroit. I don't think that's true, but there are very few of them. And the reason is because they loot, um, slow burn looting. They, they, uh, they steal from the store. And business, uh, you know, businesses call that the shrinkage. Uh, you know, they, they yes. can't make any money because people yes. keep stealing everything. Yes. And they're so dumb. And I'm not, uh, and I don't say that being mean. I mean it literally. They, they lack the intelligence to understand that what they're doing is ultimately hurting themselves. But it's that, uh, that it's that immediate gratification. And they don't think of, uh, they don't think in terms of projection long term. And so they go in, they steal whatever they can steal. And it happens uh, universally. We find it not only in the United States, we find it in South Africa, we find it in Europe. It just happens. And that's not to say that all black people are criminals and all criminals are black people. No. It is to face reality, and that is reality. That uh, the rate of crime across the board is greater in black communities than it is in white communities. Uh, the only difference is, I think, um, the only exception to that is, I think, uh, drunk driving. There are more white people per capita arrested for drunk driving than black people. But every other crime you can think of, according to the uh, Department of Justice, Bureau of Justice Statistics, every single crime you can possibly think of is more prevalent among black people than white people. So why is that? Well, I think it's because, and this is terribly politically incorrect, but it's 100% accurate. And the fact of the matter is, we all read the bell, the bell curve, or at least we know about it, is that white people have a higher intelligence level than blacks. Yes. Uh, obviously, there are exceptions. But what we find is, according to uh, the research of uh, a psychologist named Richard Lynn, that Virtually all crime is committed by, not all crime, but most crime is committed by males ages um, 18 to 49 who have IQs between 70 and 90. doesn't matter what race they are, but they're men, most, that's why, you know, most prisoners are men, not women. It's because men commit crime more frequently than women. It's, uh, and their IQs tend to be between 70 and 90, and their ages tend to be between 18 and 49. Mm -hmm. And the reason that more blacks are incarcerated than whites is because more blacks fall into that uh, IQ category. You're not supposed to say that. We can't acknowledge that. But it's a fact, you know. Um, so we would, we would say that... Uh, you know, it's immoral. Um, the racism is immoral, and I believe it is. I also believe it's illogical. You don't dislike somebody, let alone hate them, because of a genetic uh, unchangeable. You know, you can't help where your parents were. No. So I think it's immoral and illogical to hate somebody based on race, but it's also illogical and immoral to deny reality. And reality is, uh, there's a reason why privileged white liberals won't move into black neighborhoods. It's because instinctively they know they're violent. Uh, that's why you see uh, rich Hollywood liberals living in gated communities in their own homes are, are protected with, uh, some of them have armed bodyguards. Uh, who's that guy who lives in Michigan? Somebody bored, can't think of his name off the top of my head. Uh, movie producer. You know, who lives in this magnificent mansion in Michigan? Totally re removed from uh, black violence and black poverty. Yes. So that's all he'll talk about. Yes. So. Well, in South Africa as well, Ken, the people who 
are most likely to deny that there is anything wrong in that fabulous rainbow nation are those who live in the gated communities, totally removed from that, do not have to drive past the camps in their daily life, and are doing very well, thank you. They also have foreign visas in their passports that they could leave at the drop of the hat. So that kind of thing is is so hypocritical to me. We, We will deny that it's happening, but we'll make sure that we are safe. You know, and and yes, they are removed from it, and so they don't have to have their nose rubbed in it every day, and they can can be nice little liberals and say everything, but the forced integration that is is trying to happen in South Africa and that is now happening all over Europe is never going to work because we do not have the same mindset, the same values, the same anything. How can we be forced to live with people who essentially want to murder us? Well, you're dead on accurate that it cannot work, but um, we have to keep in mind that uh, success is kind of relative to what your objective is. Yes. And the objective of cultural Marxism is they don't want it to work. What uh, my theory is that cultural Marxism see a disparity of income between what they call the uh, Western nations and third world countries. And they ask themselves, how can we remove that um, economic disparity? <clears throat> well, in reality, it's the economic disparity is an outcome of uh, an intelligence disparity. The reason that uh, Western nations are more prosperous is because they're smarter. The same thing is true of East Asian countries. When you uh, allow them to operate in free economy, they prosper. Yes. Yes. And that is an anathema to Marxism. So how are they going to remove that economic disparity? Well, they have to remove the intelligence disparity. Well, how do they do that? Well, they have to remove the DNA disparity. And so they integrate us. And the end objective, I believe, is that uh, they remove the economic disparity between third world countries and Western countries. And the only way they can do that is through forced integration or through integration. It's, it really is forced integration. Because yes. I think most sensible white people in Europe don't want their countries destroyed, and nor should they. But that's what's, uh, that's what's happening. That's what's occurring. We can see it before our very eyes in our generation. The literally tens of thousands of years of Western culture and civilization is being destroyed on our watch. We can turn on our television tonight turn into the news, and we can see the so-called refugees who are really insurgents moving into Western Europe by the tens of thousands, and they're coming into the United States by the tens of thousands. There's a quote of 75,000 who come into the United States uh, every single year for agreement between Barack Obama and the United Nations. They're destroying us by design, and I think the design is to remove that, that disparity in income. You know, it's something we need to be aware of. But again, you know, like we talked about earlier, when excuse me, when Western culture falls, what falls with it is the economic infrastructure upon which all of civilization is built. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. There will, there will be no more cures to uh, to epidemics. They will just happen. They will kill millions of people. Yes. And the hardcore political left are perfectly happy with that because they want to see a population that does not exceed 500 million. They don't care if 7.5 billion humans die. So these people call themselves humanists. They're not. They're lunatics. They're anti-human. They're racist, in my opinion. And when we take a stand against them, they do again what Karl Marx <clears throat> taught is... Uh, you know, they, they accuse others of doing what you were doing, or as you mentioned earlier, you know, the world's turned upside down. Yep. The way I like to say that is, from a liberal perspective, the sun rises in the west. And so, our show is really. coming Our show is coming to an end. Um, thank you very, very much for being here. And Radio Free South Africa will be back same time next week. After every show, I get emails from people that tell me 
They would love to help the destitute, dispossessed white South Africans, but that they either do not know how or lack the means to do anything significant. Well, this is how anyone can contribute to saving white lives and bringing them to freedom. The cost of getting one white South African out of that hellhole and bringing them to the USA is about $3,000. Not a lot of money to save a life, but definitely not an amount that most of us can give at one time. However, every one of us can give 10 or $20 to this literally life or death cause. So please, think of the satisfaction of knowing that you helped to save a life and donate the best amount you can afford to our PayPal account, cooks595 at yahoo.com. That is Charlie, Oscar, Oscar, Kilo, Sugar, 595 at yahoo.com. You will be glad that you did.